This is your weekly briefing from Pursuit Magazine, brought to you by PI Education. I'm Hal Humphreys, your host. This week, memory, books, and build. First off, let's talk about memory. As private investigators, one of the things we are supposed to do is be able to coax memories out of witnesses. Memory is a strange thing. It's not recorded like this broadcast is. Uh, we don't remember things in exactly the way they happened. We store memories in random places throughout the brain. And being able to recall memories can be difficult because what we remember as truth might not actually be fact. I tell a story about a lawyer and a witness and me sitting on a back porch and a snake falls off the roof onto the ground. We screamed like little boys, ran off, and the witness's mom comes out and says, you know, what happened? What happened? And we're like, oh, a snake fell on the ground. She says, what kind is it? Well, the lawyer says, it's a big brown snake. And the witness says, no, no, it was, it was kind of purple and iridescent. And I said, no, it was, it was black. The truth of the matter is a little bit hard to get around. The fact is there was a snake. My truth is it was black. The witness's truth, it was kind of iridescent. The lawyer's truth, it was maybe a brown snake. Memory is weird. And that happened immediately. The further we get away from an incident, the further we get away from an event, the more likely it is to have varying memories. So that's one of the reasons we as private investigators try to talk to a number of witnesses to kind of sort through the individual witness's truths to get to the facts. I picked up a new book the other day. Uh, the book is called Build for Tomorrow. It is a book by Jason Pfeiffer. Jason is the editor in chief at Entrepreneur Magazine. He is a super nice guy and he is a super smart guy. This book is great for anyone that's in business. If you have any kind of an entrepreneurial spirit, I can strongly recommend you pick up a copy of this book. Uh, go to Amazon.com. You can go to your local bookstore. I've even seen this book in airport um, bookstores. It's a great book. If you get a chance, go pick up Build for Tomorrow by Jason Pfeiffer, Editor-in-Chief at um, Entrepreneur Magazine. I had the chance this morning to spend a little time talking with Jason. Here is my interview with Jason Pfeiffer. I've got a guest today. I've got Jason Pfeiffer, editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. Jason is someone that I consider a friend. We have spent time together. He is one of the friendliest, nicest, most giving people I've ever met, which I think puts him in a unique position to offer advice to people that are entrepreneurs. So Jason, the reason I wanted to talk to you is I saw a blog post last week about memory. And yeah. In, in thinking about private investigators and interview skills and stuff like that, talk to me a little bit about your blog post and memory and how we, we kind of store things in little bits and places and we're trying to build them back together when we're talking to people. Yeah, that's right. So this came out of research that I did for Quick Plug, my new book. So here it is called Build for Tomorrow. And uh, the book is about how to become more adaptable. And the last chapter of Build for Tomorrow is about how we misunderstand our own histories. I wrote this because I wanted people who are going through big change to recognize how they're processing that change. But you make a really interesting point that for private investigators who need to understand how people are recalling things and, and how to engage them, this, this takes on a whole new meaning. So let me tell you what I learned. The reason I got into this was because, do you remember how the just as vaccines for COVID were rolling out, people started talking nostalgically for COVID. Right? We went from feeling immensely frustrated to suddenly nostalgic for it. People were saying, oh, it was a simpler time. I, I, had, I, I had time with my family, right? And I thought, why is this happening? It's so weird. And, uh, but also what a great example of how we romanticize the past despite all evidence that it wasn't as rosy as we're thinking. So I started to call these researchers uh, who focus on memory. And uh, one of them in particular, this guy, uh, Philippe de Brigard at Duke University. And they explained a couple really fascinating things to me about how we process our memories. So number one, the thing to understand is that 
we, our brains do not work like the devices you and I are using right now to talk to each other, right? Our camera and our microphones, these are designed for total recall. They are storage devices. And yet our brains are not storage devices. Our brains are filtration devices. Their job is not actually to retain everything that ever happened and then recall it perfectly. Our brains are designed for something else. So what is that? Well, to understand that, let's talk about how memory actually works. So when we experience something and we retain it, our brains absorb it, we don't remember it like a single file, like this file that, that, that's being created as we talk right now. Instead, what happens is that our brain actually takes this memory and it breaks it up into a million little pieces and it stores them separately, separately in our brains. And then whenever we go to remember something, our brains actually reassemble the memory from all of these pieces at the time of recall. But the problem is that when it reassembles something, it doesn't have every piece. Some pieces are missing. Uh, Philippe at, at Duke, Duke University described it to me kind of like a paleontologist putting together a dinosaur bone, which is to say there are going to be pieces that are missing. And the paleontologist will fill those pieces in with the best knowledge that they have about how that dinosaur was structured. You know what we do? What we do is we imagine. Because the parts of our brains that are associated with memory are actually incredibly closely associated with the parts of our brains associated with imagination. And so when we are recalling something, we're pulling together these disparate parts of a memory, and then we're filling in the gaps with our own imagination, and we're experiencing that as truth. So that's one thing to know. The second thing to know is this. We experience something that is called fading affect bias. So fading affect bias is a fascinating phenomenon inside of our brains. Totally natural. It is that the emotions associated with good memories last a lot longer in our heads than the, the emotions associated with bad memories. Now, trauma can obviously change this, but in normal memory experience, that's what's happening. Now, why is all of this happening? The reason is, like I said, because our brains are not storage devices. Our brains are designed for one thing and one thing only, and that is to move us forward. So the reason why we are forgetting the emotions associated with bad memories is so that we can move on, so that every time we think of something, we are not pulled backwards, so that we will take another risk, even though the last one didn't work out, so that a, a woman will be willing to have a second child, right? <laughs> every, every time I talk about this in groups, there's always a woman who's like, I, I think I know what this is for. So this is the reason why we do this. And then similarly, our brains are, are, are really just retaining the information that's valuable for us to move forward, not to recall everything from the past. So right. this is good in that it means that we're not being constantly yanked backwards. But of course, it leads to all sorts of problems, nostalgia being one of them. But also, if you're a private investigator and you're trying to get information out of people and they have maybe a hazy or a slightly different recollection of something, you know, that is unfortunately the nature of the human brain. And that's, that's, that's something that we've We've been built to do a single thing, which is to move forward. But obviously, a thing that we have not been built to do is recall things well enough to repeat them perfectly to private investigators as much as that would be useful. Yeah, and I think one of the, one of the things that, that, that the reasons I wanted to have this conversation is it's really important for investigators to remember people are it's, it's like you've got a file you've stored in the cloud and they put a piece of the file in Tacoma and a piece of the file in New York and a piece of you know, it's all over the place. Yeah. And sometimes that crawler that pieces all these things back together doesn't put it together right. And mm -hmm. for, for people recalling traumatic memories for private investigators, a lot of times that's what we're doing. Yeah. It can be really difficult. And there are ways you can help people access different mm -hmm. parts of their memory, um, asking them to remember what the what the temperature was like, what the weather was like, mm. was it raining, was it snowing? And that can open up little pathways, connections to get them to access their, access other parts of their memory. But I found the article absolutely fascinating and I, I thank you for taking the time to do this. I do wanna do one thing. I'm gonna switch to, yeah. a, um, to a screen share real quick and just brag on your book. This is Jason <laughs> Pfeiffer's book, Build for Tomorrow. And I will say this, Jason, I, I have not had a chance to read the entire book. I'm about, I don't know, 60 pages in. And awesome. I'm loving it. 
and we do a lot of things with real estate appraisers and private investigators through education. And one of the things that the real estate appraisal side seems to be having a real struggle with lately is there are some changes afoot in the real estate appraisal world. There's some mm. complaints about the way things are done. They're trying to redo things. And I think the anecdote you tell about the music business is appropriate for real estate appraisers. Yes, things will change, but there are new opportunities that happen when that happens. Yeah. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you that one quickly. So the, this anecdote that I, I'll tell you, which comes from the history of recorded music, is, is, is a lesson I have found in a problem we all have when we experience change, which is that we experience change as loss, and then we extrapolate the loss. So we see a new change coming. We say, this means that I no longer have access to this old thing that I'm comfortable with and familiar with, so that feels like loss to me. And because I want to know what's happening next, I'm going to extrapolate upon what I know, which is to say, well, I've lost this, which means that I will lose this, which means that I will lose this. Um, what does that look like, practically speaking? Well, here's a story. So in the, at the dawn of recorded music, late 1800s, the phonograph is a brand new invention. It's the first record player. And uh, this is the first time in human history, consider how just miraculous this was, first time in human history that people could listen to music without a human being playing an instrument in front of them. Pretty marvelous. And uh, people didn't even believe it at the time. They, they had to be shown that there wasn't a band behind a wall somewhere playing. And then when they finally accepted it, they, they, uh, 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 they brought it into their homes. They were fascinated by it. They, they were excited by it. Musicians, on the other hand, were not excited about it. Musicians saw themselves being replaced. And the leader of the resistance at the time is this guy named John Philip Sousa, whose name you may not know, but whose music you certainly do. He wrote all the military marches we're still familiar with today. Da, 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 da. Right, that's John Philip Sousa. So John Philip Sousa wrote this piece. You should Google it. It's wonderful. It's called The Menace of Mechanical Music. He wrote it in Appleton's Magazine in 1906. And he made all these arguments against recorded music about why it was going to be so damaging and terrible. And his, 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 my favorite of his arguments went like this. He said that if you bring recorded music into the home, it will replace all forms of live music. Because, of course, why would somebody perform live when there's a machine that can do it for them? And then because there's no live music in the home anymore, mothers will not sing to their children. Because again, why would they do that when there's now a machine that can do it? And because children imitate their mothers, the children will grow up to imitate the machines. And thus we will raise a generation of machine babies. Uh, this, this is a very real argument that he made that it was even illustrated. And you know, you see what he was doing there. He was extrapolating the loss. We're gonna lose this, then naturally we'll lose this next thing, and then naturally we'll lose this next thing. But the problem is of course that for him, it was a ton of wasted energy because that is clearly not what happened. And the thing is, yes, change does bring about some loss of the familiar, but it also brings about gain. And so our jobs really should be not to resist, not to hold on to something that may become outdated, but rather to say, okay, this is happening. Whether I like it or not, this is happening. And so my opportunity now is actually to identify the gain to try to filter what is happening through the lens of how can this be put to good use and then start to utilize that, start to move towards it, start to experiment with it. Because I will tell you what will happen as a result. You will gain a competitive advantage because you will see the new opportunities before others do. Which is the reason why after a period of time where John Philip Sousa was writing crazy things, that guy realized that actually there was a lot of money to be made in recorded music. He can now reach people without having to travel to them. It was scalable. And so he started recording his music and he started going on the radio, which he had also originally opposed doing. And you know, just imagine how much more money he could have made had he not wasted all that time being resistant to it and just gotten there. That's it. That's absolutely it. Jason, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. I appreciate it. One more plug for the book. Um, if you want to get a copy of Jason's book, uh, it's on Amazon. I bought several copies on Amazon. Build for Tomorrow by Jason Pfeiffer, um, editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. Jason, thank you again so much thank for being you. here. 
Hal, it is always great to talk to you. Uh, we, we, um, we need to catch up in a way that isn't recorded for some sort of uh, <laughs> consumption. Uh, but uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, please pick up the book. Hal, you're a delight. And that's your weekly briefing from PI Education and Pursuit Magazine. I'm Hal Humphreys, your host. And now a quick shout out to our sponsors.